First things first, I was talking with Fraser, I'd just like to let you all know um, that this is actually a picture of my beard, not wheat. Um, <laughs> which is in line with what Warwick is saying. I'm not offended if you call me the big bushy beard man. My Instagram handle is the bald ginger. So um, I self-deprecate is the way to go, I feel. But I want to um, just impart on you today some, some insight that I've had to work on in my own life. Um, and this song that we've just listened to really goes to the point of where do we find our identity? What voices do we listen to in our lives because there are voices coming at us from all different directions and depending on what stage of life you're in depends on what those voices might be um, especially kind of that teenage high school years there are a lot of negative voices that we hear and we see a lot of issues with teenagers because of that but I want to share with you that there are these voices there are these lies that people tell us all of the time but there's a truth that is told to us quite regularly that oftentimes we don't actually listen to. And I want to just encourage you to listen and lean into the, the voices of truth rather than these lies that come at us. So uh, come with me on a little bit of a journey. I want to look at today, and the, the, the sermon title is um, Servant to Son, but I'm looking at the notion of perfectionism. Now, I'm looking around and I can't see... Jared, where is Jared? There. Is Kylie here? No, I think Kylie would have been the only person here who might have been at my wedding. Um, so this story has a bit to do with my wedding, unless there's someone else that I can't see. Um, so Emma and I have been married for a little while, um, coming up to eight years. Woohoo! Um, oh, thanks, guys. No one's really excited. <laughs> uh, um, so one thing that you need to know about us is that when we started dating, I don't like preaching with things in my pocket, someone can steal my car. Um, when we started dating, we actually started dating and two months later, actually no, like two weeks later, um, Emma moved to Melbourne, I stayed at Avondale, then two months later I moved to the States um, and she stayed in Melbourne and then when I came back from the States, I went back to Avondale and she stayed in Melbourne and our whole relationship up until the month of our wedding was long distance. The longest period of time we ever spent together was the, the trip over to the States. We went over to America for a, a friend's wedding. Um, and that was the longest continuous period we ever spent together, 12 days. Um, and so we got engaged. Do you know how <laughs> difficult it is then after that to plan a wedding in Melbourne when one of you is a, who's a teacher here? Oh, a few, all right. Teachers, keep your hands up. Keep your hand up if, as a teacher, you have any spare time to even scratch yourself. <laughs> exactly. Teachers have no spare time. So here I am, engaged to a teacher, trying to plan a wedding. She has no time. Here I am, up at Avondale, trying to plan a wedding in Melbourne. It's very difficult. But one of the things that comes in handy, and what I want to look at today is this notion of spiritual perfectionism, is that my personal perfectionistic tendencies, which can influence my view of God and my relationship to him, actually can come in handy at times as well. As negative as they can be for my spiritual life, they can be positive in some other ways. So here we are planning for our wedding. Um, and we were married in, in uh, 2015. And when you plan for a wedding, there are many things you need to consider. Food, big one. We wanted to have a wedding where no one went to McDonald's afterwards. Um, we succeeded. Um, then you have all of the, the details, you know, invitations. How, you know, spend a lot of money on invitations, unless you're us, you spend $40 on an online system and everything goes out by email, and then you get an app. So cheap. All you need is email addresses. Unfortunately, not everyone has them. Um, then you've got suits for me. I've got to sort out suits, cufflinks, ties, socks, shoes, um, wedding cars, uh, you know, flowers, bonbonnières, you name it. There's a lot of detail that has to go into a wedding. Now, my perfectionistic tendencies and the fact that I was at Avondale at the time meant that when I came down to Melbourne, we had to be onto it. We had no time to dilly dally. We're task oriented. We get this done. Who's planned a wedding before? Only like three of you. 
Did you just rock up and it was done? So when you plan a wedding, there can be high stress involved. Now, Emma used to work in kind of events and things. Um, she did makeup for big events and did makeup for a lot of weddings. So her ability to, to be task oriented was quite high. My undergraduate degree was in business management. I had a double major. One of my majors was tourism and my specialization was event management. And so planning a wedding was a breeze for us. We were the only couple I'm aware of in history that in the month leading up to their wedding had nothing to do because it was done. <laughs> my perfectionistic tendencies came in really, really handy. I tend to call myself, uh, I think that I have a little bit of OCD, except I like to call it CDO because the letters have to be in the alphabetical order. <laughs> That's how bad my perfectionistic tendencies can be. Now, the downside to that is, is when that comes into my spiritual life. And I want to have a, a little bit of a play around with a couple of things. I need a volunteer. Anyone. This, this volunteer needs to be a bit, bit more adult aged. Sorry, kids. Oh, we, we can stay here for a long time. Awesome. What's your name? Erica. Erica. Glad to meet you. Everyone else seems to know your name already. Um, surprise, surprise. Now, Erica, are you married? Yes. Yes. And um, who does the majority of household chores in your house? No, it's split down the middle. Split down the middle? Yep. Oh, nice to hear. Okay. So who does the dishes? Both. Both. Okay. Who does, who makes the bed? Both. Cool. Like you do your half and he does his half. <laughs> um, all right. So what I want you to do, this is my perfectionist. We're going to have a little bit of a game. How's your washing folding ability? Awesome. All right. Let's put that one because we don't want that one to break. All right. So I want you, this is, this is my perfectionistic tendencies going bad. Okay. You've got that towel. Really nice towel. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit old now. Um, fold a towel for me. Show me how you fold a towel. So you're just going to throw it. <laughs> I disagree. The reason, no, no, the reason you do it this way to start with is then when you pull it out, you hang it straight over the rail uh -huh. and it's ready to go, uh -huh. you see. But anyhow, continuing on with my folding, there's a reason I do things the way that I do them. Uh -huh. It's not just because I'm weird, although that might factor in your cupboard. And then in thirds. Uh -huh. Now, the important thing when you do that, though, is when you've got the other towel, you actually have to have it so it sits that way in the cupboard so that it balances out, right? All right. Uh, how's your sock folding ability? I promise these are clean. You are not welcome in my house. All right. My sock folding. Got one sock? Got another sock. This is going to sound really weird, but this is the way I do it. <laughs> One, inside out. One always inside out. How's your leg? Just so people can see. So you've got the uh, inside out one on the bottom. Three folds. And that way. Like that. And then, then you put it in your cupboard like that. So that when you open your drawer, you know what sock you got, okay? Um, all right, the big, the big test, the fitted sheet. So as you're doing that, I'm gonna, gonna share with the rest of the people, and you can pay attention there, but listen here. I'll go for it. Um, in my household, I do all of the laundry. 
Part of the reason is my wife is so small she can't reach the clothesline. <laughs> but aside from that, when she hangs the washing on the line, or even on the clothes horse, she doesn't hang it right. There's too many creases, the, the seams don't match. When it comes to folding a sheet, or you know, she's too small, she can't do it. When it comes to making the bed, she can't reach the other side, so she literally just jumps across the bed and then ruins the bed making ability. That is horrible. <laughs> You may sit down, but thank you so much. Um, you rolled that. In my household, I do all of this because my perfectionistic tendencies are so severe that I don't allow Emma to do any of this. She is aware of this, and so when I need a, like a change of clothes when we're going somewhere afterwards, I can tell her exactly, you know, it's this pair of pants in my cupboard, it's on this shelf, and it's three pants down. Um, <laughs> When she really wants to help me out, she will fold the washing by pulling one item of everything out from my cupboard as a template on how to fold the washing, okay? So for all of those ladies out there who think their husband doesn't know how to do anything, you married the wrong guy. Um, so a fitted sheet always is corner to corner. I can fold a fitted sheet flat. I'm very happy about it. Corner to corner. Always use a flat surface. If you don't have a table, the floor's okay, unless it's not been vacuumed recently. <laughs> Make sure you don't have any weird kind of foldy, seamy bits. Oh, so many, ugh, <laughs> ugh. The amount of times that I have preached this type of sermon, and everyone's like, all right, I didn't listen to anything you said, but can you teach me how to fold a fitted sheet? Um, <laughs> Ben, depends how many fitted sheets you have. There's my flat fitted sheet. So, in, in my household, all of, the, all of the gentlemen afterwards, we're gonna have a workshop on this. Um, in my household, my perfectionistic tendencies, which I have in my own way of living, have heavily influenced at times my relationship with God, my relationship with church, and in fact, my ability to function. Um, because what I have found is that perfectionistic tendencies do quite a few things. I feel at times in my Christian walk, I've kind of gone, I need things in order, I need things perfect. And if I need that, then God needs that in me. If God needs that in me, then I am beyond his capacity. I will never be acceptable to him. But that's not what God says. God tells me in the book of Hebrews, God said that he will never leave me nor forsake me. God never said, I will only stay with you if you are perfect and I will definitely forsake you if you can't fold a fitted sheet flat. He never said anything like that. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yet in my Christian walk, because of my personality trait of being, having things to, to be a little bit perfect, um, I often fall into that rut of going, you know, I'm not good enough for this Christian life. I'm not good enough for God. I'm not good enough because I'm not studying my Bible enough. I'm not reading my Bible an hour a day or an hour and a half a day, or whatever the, the daily amount that you have to read your Bible is. I'm not good enough because I don't treat everyone with the utmost respect. In fact, sometimes I, I will judge people for them not being perfect enough, but excuse myself for not being perfect enough as well as though there's a different standard there as well. But these perfectionistic tendencies of mine have led in my life to procrastination and paralysis at times, where I just can't function. Perfect example, apologies everyone, this is not pizza. Last Saturday evening, Emma booked us in for, we went a few weeks ago to the um, Pablo Picasso exhibit at NGV. And then last Saturday evening, we went to Chadston um, for the Picasso paint plate painting workshop. Um, as a perfectionistic person, I hate the creative space. Because if I can't do it perfect, I'm not going to do it. And so we're there, we've got a time frame of like an hour and a half to do this sketching, this painting, this whatever it is. And I am there for 20 minutes and I, Emma and I are almost having an argument in the middle of Chadston because Josh can't function. I am paralyzed 
to function. And so in the end, this is not me trying to show off, I ended up painting this plate. <laughs> what I did to start with is I tried to draw an eye like this and it actually looked more like a stalk of wheat um, on my paper. Um, but as I continued on with this, I found that, yes, I made errors. So if you, if you were to analyse this very closely, the brush stroke on this little eyelash is in a different direction to these ones. This is my favourite eyelash. These little eyelashes, there's a big fat one. That's my other favourite. And I found that it is through these imperfections that there's actually better character. It is through these sorts of things that there is a uniqueness to this plate than to anyone else's plate. And I want to encourage you that in your personality, there are challenges that come with your personality. Don't you worry, there are. Um, but it is through those that you are uniquely you. And that is exactly who God wants you to be. You don't need to fit into the box that someone else has created for you. So this idea of perfectionism has led me to paralysis just last Saturday evening. Ecclesiastes 11 says, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. You can't get by in life by just sitting there. You can't get by in your journey with God by just sitting there and not actually investing in that. Start somewhere. And that's what I found last Saturday night. All I had to do was start. And as I started, something else came to mind. Something else came after that. If we wait for the perfect conditions, it's likely all we're ever going to do is wait because the conditions are never perfect. My perfectionistic tendency leads me to believe that in my Christian life, salvation is reserved only for the elite and I'm not one of them. I'm not one of the elite and so God doesn't want me. Yet when I read through scripture, I find that God actually went to those who were very much not elite. That's where he spent most of his time. When Jesus was on this earth, he went to those who were not elite. Perfectionistic theology also lends itself to the idea that only those who are able to dis discipline themselves to a particular standard are worthy of that community or of that salvation. And what happens then, and I want you to ponder this, what happens then when you have people in your community that begin to question that standard, that begin to question that expectation? Well, very quickly, in my experience, those people are ostracised. Those people are cut off. Those people are not welcome in that community anymore. And unfortunately, it is when those communities of faith, that when we do that, as though we are representing God, we actually give a false picture of who God is as well. The other thing that my perfectionistic tendencies and perfectionistic theology leads to is unrealistic expectations of others. Um, I shared this briefly a moment ago, but I wonder how many of you this morning like to be nagged? You're a liar, Fabio. <laughs> Um, Proverbs 17 says, whoever would foster love covers over an offence, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Perfectionism leads to a desire to correct. A relationship with God leads to a desire to connect. Pause on that for a moment. Perfectionistic theology leads to correct. A relationship with Jesus leads to connect. But more than that, whilst I might have unrealistic expectations of others, the flow on is that I then have unrealistic expectations of self. I'm simply not good enough. There's truth to that. I'm not good enough in my own right, but I am good enough because Jesus already paid the price, made the plan and set me free from all of the chains that have held me so that I can be liberated into eternity 
with him. Ecclesiastes, great book, another quote from it, do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? That's not saying don't strive for bettering yourself, but don't think that there is a destination that you can arrive at. You're always growing. You're always going to be able to better yourself. You're always going to be able to better your understanding of God and your relationship with Him. But more so, and perhaps one of the really crucial things about perfectionistic tendencies, goodness, I picked the worst word to preach with, didn't I? Is that it focuses on me rather than focusing me on God. I am not good enough. My eyes are on me. God is good enough for everyone. God is good enough to overlook my faults, to overlook my imperfections, to overlook the things that are not right but I'm working on. God knows that I'm not good enough, which is why he had that plan of salvation in place. Perfectionistic thinking, perfectionistic theology is, how do I reduce my sin quotient so that my good quotient, in comparison to it, outweighs the sin. It's very much a works-based life. Perfectionistic thinking then leads me to isolate myself from community. For fear of judgment. For fear that someone might actually cotton on to who I really am. For fear that someone might look at me and be disgusted by what they see because the reality is when I look in the mirror, I'm disgusted by what I see. But again, that's because my eyes are focused on me and not on God. What I want you to do along with me is get to the point in your relationship with God that when you look in the mirror, you see a reflection of the Son of God. Even in the imperfections that you bring to the table. But the most important thing that I need to leave um, with you today is that perfectionistic thinking simply lacks faith. Because what it says is that what God had in in store, what plan he had, the salvation that was allegedly given to me through the death of Jesus on the cross, that actually doesn't work. I still need to do something else. I still need to make sure that I am better. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be better, but don't base your salvation on being the best. Because Isaiah tells us that all of your righteous acts are like filthy rags. Nothing that you do will actually help you in getting salvation. If we know from the Bible that our acts of righteousness are filthy, then why then do we continue to live in a place of perfectionistic thinking? Christian author and counsellor Jane Hunt makes the following statement, and I want, to, I want to give you this thought today because I think it's really crucially important, is that God calls you to be a pursuer of excellence, not a prisoner of perfectionism. You can pursue to be better. You can pursue excellence. In fact, my recommendation, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, everyone needs to sing a song type of thing, God calls us to make a joyful noise. Often he doesn't say you need to be in tune. Um, but for the worship team up here, and I'm glad to have the worship team that we have here as well, when you come up the front to lead a congregation in worship, you don't do it with a mediocre attempt. You do it with excellence. You bring your best to the table knowing full well that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to sing the wrong note or play the wrong key or whatever musicians do because I'm not musical. But you do it with excellence as as an offering to God. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to bring excellence. You see, the perfectionist is one who really can't see the forest from the trees. And what I mean by that is another example of mine. I also at home like to, not, don't like to, I need to get in the garden and tidy it up. There's weeds there, there's weeds there, the roses are overgrown, all that kind of stuff. 
I'm one who then, when I get out to trim the rose bushes to you know, make sure that they're not overgrown, trim a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. And then this side is uneven to this side. So I have to then trim a little bit more here. And now that's uneven to this side. And I trim a little bit more here. And next thing you know, I just have a stub down here. <laughs> because I'm focused on that one little detail that no one else notices because there's a beautiful rose bush in front of you. Are you focusing so much on your own behaviour, your own kind of issues that you have with, with your relationship with God that you actually forget that God's wanting that relationship with you too? God's not looking at those things. What he's looking at is, do you desire to know me? Sure, you're going to forget to pray one day. You're going to curse one day. But do you still desire to know me? Start there and build on it. Quick, text bar, quick fire Bible texts. I want to encourage you to replace your perfectionistic thinking with the liberating power of God's truth. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that tells me is that I don't always have to measure up because no one is perfect. Romans 8.38 and 39 For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. What that tells me is I never have to fear losing God's love because of anything I might or might not do. It's always there for me. Psalm 139. I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. That tells me that I can stop comparing myself to others because God designed me to be me, a unique, one-of-a-kind person. Proverbs 3.26 For the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. I can confidently take on new challenges because of this because I'm not limited to doing only the things that I excel at. And interestingly, I think I excel at excel, just <laughs> quietly. Um, John eight thirty six. So if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Free to enjoy life because God doesn't want me in bondage to a set of rules and regulations that are actually not going to get me to heaven, but my relationship with him is. Yes, my behavior may change as my relationship with him grows, but it's not that behavior that matters, it's that relationship that matters. And the final quick fire, Philippians 3, 7, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever I did for my own self doesn't matter because Christ has done even more. So I want to share with you one of the most famous Bible verses, passages, books, thingies, stories that we have in Luke chapter 15. The story of the prodigal son. Because what this tells me, don't throw your notes away when you're not done with them. What this tells me is that far too often when it comes to our salvation, we actually have the wrong mindset. You know the story of the prodigal son? We're not going to read right through it, but I'm going to give you a little bit. The story of the prodigal son is found in Luke chapter 15, and I want to read just verses 29 to 32, the very end. Uh, 28 to start with. The older brother became angry and refused to go into the house, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours, you can hear the disdain in his voice. When this son of yours, not this brother of mine, this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? The father responds, my son, you are always with me and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. In this story, we have this son who stayed home, who tried to work his way into his father's favour, not knowing that he already was in his father's favour. Guys, you are already in God's favour. This son, who was still at home, trying to work his way, considered himself needing to work his way into his father's favour, as though he were his father's slave or his father's servant. Are you in the house of God with the mindset of being a servant or a slave rather than being a son or daughter of God? Because the relationship that a slave has with the, with the master is a very different relationship than what a son or a daughter has with their father. And the father in heaven wants you to be their child, not their slave. A slave works because they have to. A slave works because they need to please their master. A son, a daughter has already received the grace of the father because of who they are and their identity because of their relationship with him. The son that stayed in Luke 15 didn't see this. And it's been my journey that I've struggled to see this in my own Christian life, that God has already said to me, Josh, you are a son of mine. You don't need to do anything else. Sure, better yourself. Pursue excellence. But rocking up to church half an hour early isn't going to get you in heaven be great if you did so that we could start on time every week, but it's not going to get you into heaven. Studying your Bible at six o'clock every morning, not going to get you into heaven. Pursuing that relationship with me and recognizing that I am God, I am your father and you are my son, that's what matters. And as a father, I'm not a parent, I have a father though, as a father, I'm going to overlook some of those imperfections. I'm going to overlook the things that you despise about yourself, the things that you can't yet do, and I'm going to do those for you. But you can't earn your salvation, so I'm just going to give that one to you. Just stay connected with me. Most of the Christian greats in history have tried the performance-based lifestyle, the servant or slave-based lifestyle. Martin Luther tried it. John Wesley tried it. A little lady by the name of Alan White tried it. But John Wesley's conversion statement illustrates the change in his own life really well. He listened as a Moravian Christian read the preface of Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. Now, there you go. If you ever want to grow in your, your faith with God, read the commentaries. Apparently, it you know, changes your life, or it did for John Wesley at least. But John Wesley, just listening to someone read the preface to the commentary, says, about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I didn't trust in Christ, Christ alone at least, for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even my sins, and saved me from the law of sin and death. 
Wesley went on to say that he became an altogether Christian after that. And that whereas before he had been a servant, now he saw himself as a son. You see, a servant is accepted and appreciated on the basis of what he does, whereas a child is accepted on the basis of who he is. A servant starts the day anxious and worried, wondering, how might I please my master today? Where the, the child rests in the secure love of his family. The servant is accepted because of their workmanship, the son and daughter because of their relationship. The servant is accepted because of his productivity or his performance, the child simply because of his position as a person. At the end of the day, the servant has peace of mind only if he is sure he has proven his worth through his work. The next day, that anxiety comes back and we have to start again. A child, a child of God, can be secure in his mind all day because his relationship with his father is not going to change tomorrow only in that it might grow deeper and deeper. So the song that we listened to at the start was what love has the Father lavished on us that we should be called children of God? Ponder that. You are a child of God. That's your identity. We are all leaning towards at times because of the world in which we live, trying to be servants, earning our way to heaven. Lean into your sonship. Lean into your daughtership. And then, as we sing this final song, I want you to just meditate on the words of this final song, that you are no longer afraid to show God your weaknesses. You're no longer afraid to show Him your flaws and your failures because you, because you know that He's seen them all and He still calls you friend. Friend.